Good afternoon. I'm Philip Beasley. I'm from Waterloo Architecture, and I work in an architecture studio. I'm lucky to work with some extraordinary, brilliant colleagues trying to develop a future kind of architecture, an architecture with some rather special qualities, an architecture that asks some fundamental questions about the way our environment could live in the future. Could architecture respond to us? Could buildings know about us? Might they care about us? Might they start in some fundamental and primitive ways to be alive? Let me start with some basic ideas about the way architecture works. Now, if it was 50 years ago and I was being taught by my own teachers, let's say Buckminster Fuller, the great engineer from 50 years ago, I would have been taught probably that the ideal kind of architecture, the optimal sustainable architecture would be that of a sphere, a perfect kind of minimum surface with a maximum enclosed volume, absolutely sustainable, energy harvesting, good solid boundaries, absolutely distinct from its neighbor, kind of a perfect kind of building. The very curious thing about this kind of, of, uh, of building shape though, the sphere and cube and, and closed boundaries, is that they hold on to their energy and that they absolutely resist relationships with their neighbors. In some ways, they're the worst forms we can use for sustainability rather than the best forms because they don't like losing heat and they don't like working with their neighbors. In some ways, a whole different family of forms, diffusive forms, are very promising for sustainable living architecture. If I'm an amoeba, then I might be following my own will. I might be putting out some of, some of my, my pseudopods. I might be chasing food. I might be chasing influences in the environment. And I might have some sense of intention. But equally, I suspect that the amoeba is actually pulled by its environment, constantly reaching and constantly buffeted by the forces all around it. And the kind of back and forth, the oscillation between the environment, between the surroundings and the being, becomes a really remarkable kind of entanglement, a mutual relationship which moves back and forth rather than just this closed form, this individual bounded strong figure just walking on the empty plane of a, of a previous historical idea of living in the environment. The kind of environments that I've been working on with my colleagues are similar to this. Here's the, uh, the installation from the Venice Biennale that we mounted last year a diffuse meshwork of many, many layers, filtering material through it, working like a great expanded environment. If we compress this down together, and we perhaps turned it sideways, that might make a breathing wall of the future. Right now, it's, it stands in an expanded state. The kind of behavior of these environments is very gentle. There are tiny, small amounts of movement riddled through every bit of these, these environments. This is far from, let's say, a robot where you push a button and you expect a machine to do its bidding. Instead, these kind of environments work in incremental, breathing, gentle ways, expanding your own physiology, working in a kind of a mutual relationship with you. When you walk through these environments, first of all, the atmosphere is very quiet. You move as if through a grove, through a wilderness or a forest. There are small social spaces that you wander through and perhaps converse with other people. Gradually, you become aware of small amounts of motion as proximity sensors, which are riddled throughout the environment, and microprocessors, which are fit throughout the environment, start to track your presence and reach out towards you and emit a whole gentle breathing, rippling wave of, of, uh, of, of, of gentle movements of air that move throughout the environment. When we came here and when we colonized this land, those of us that colonized this land, we might have had the idea that the ground was absolutely solid and certain. Nature had such extraordinary majesty to it that we could rest with the idea that the ground was absolutely solid. It would be our home. I mean, if we have that kind of idea of architecture, then architecture might have a very simple job to do. It might be a great enclosing filter around us, which is sensitive, which amplifies our own experience outwards, maybe which filters the environment back in. In this past century, though, a rather different relationship with the, with the environment has emerged. That is to say that 
in this last century, there's been a striking sense of complete independence from the world. The idea that humans are independent, are working in a void, are radically free. Now that has its own kind of beauty, perhaps. And architecture, again, has a particular relationship in this modern world. The idea of independent bubbles, of self-sufficient terraria, of perhaps the, the domes of the 50s and 60s we might, we might think of, perhaps man in his world, the great dome of Expo 67, we might, might think of that kind of architecture, a self-sufficient world. What about the world as we see it today? Because the, the kind of pictures that I just described, both the solid world and that free void, are things that I think we've moved completely beyond. They're still with us. But when I think of the ground that I stand on today, I can't think of it as certain. And I certainly don't think of it as just absent and free. Instead, I see such a poignant, almost unspeakably vulnerable sense of the world being in flux, of being uncertain, of the very integrity of life being something we simply cannot rely on. What kind of architecture might respond to this kind of question, this sense of the environment that we live in today? Let me just go through a few technologies that give us a sense of how we might start to work with this kind of vision. Geotextiles, precast concrete running up a, a steep slope, taken over by turf, and eventually that kind of, of, uh, of geotextile becomes unnecessary because the turf starts to grow itself and starts to have its own integrity. This is an interesting way to start to build up an earth reinforcement system. The very surface of the earth can be built this way, a kind of synthetic flesh. It's very interesting to look at internal systems as well, such as the lymphatic system in our own body, a system of toxin processing little valves and pumps with, sub with subsidiary chemistries that are really very different from our central circulation system. We've been working with those kind of notions, the, the, ide the idea of earth reinforcement, surface reinforcement, and processing systems in a set, in a set of protocell chemistries, that is, prototype cell systems which are riddled throughout the environments we've been developing as a kind of synthetic metabolism. Here you can see a carbon processing system in, in, in the images here. Here you can see some skin regenerating systems at work in, 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 in other chemical uh, experiments. Here's a, 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 a copper sulfate crystal with a ferric solution blooming in, in these os osmotic layers ar around, around this crystal, making a self-regenerating kind of growing skin that can have very promising qualities for a future architecture which could grow its own skins and regenerate itself. These kind of experiments then actually have a sense of being a kind of expanded physiology that work outside our own boundaries, that start to set up multiple octaves of layers, of gentle filtering layers around each of our bodies and which can make a very interesting kind of architecture of the future. And this image by a wonderful colleague, the, the Yale uh, mechanical engineer, Michelle Addington, might give us a, an example of how this could work. Michelle shows in, 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 this, in this thermal photograph how each of our bodies has miniature convective plumes of air running around each, each of us, actually in a set of octaves of thermal exchange. And it turns each of us in a, into a kind of miniature thermal pump, the, the kind of impact of exchange of having a, a set of atmospheres and weather systems running around each of our bodies has a really remarkable kind of quality that's very encouraging for this architecture. And let me expand this by perhaps giving an image of what I think this architecture could look like by looking at a very early Renaissance painting by Nino de Vici, a fl wonderful Florentine painter. I'm interested in the material qualities of this vesica form, this extraordinary halo that runs around this figure. And I think that this kind of multiple layered approach, very gentle, sens sensitive, multiple layered filtered approach to architecture might be a kind of architecture that could guide us here. So let me share then the images of some of the actual product projects. And we're looking at the Venice installation here in this environment 
we move through multiple clouds and filters of small material. This material is individually custom designed by digital fabrication and, and, and by mechatronics, that is working with, with electro electronics and, and mechanical components in many, many layers. Each individual component is deliberately weak and tiny and simple so we can multiply it by thousands of times. We run computers, very miniature, simple insect-like computers in networks, in village-like networks throughout this environment. And this sets up a space-sensing array which can track your movement and which knows that you're there. When you walk up to some of these elements, your, your position is tracked and then they move back to you, re reaching out and sending out rippling peristaltic waves. Peristalsis is a kind of a domino chain, swallowing like, like movement, resulting from many, many little, little actions that are chained together, reaching in an extremely gentle, rolling, res responsive way that sets up a kind of a breathing motion. This is trickling air, which is pulling the air through the filters, which, which, which make for the entire architecture being a kind of distributed lung. Here you can see some of the microprocessors, the Arduino small, small, small uh, miniature computers, which are riddled throughout this system. And you can see the kind of layered strata that make this system work a little bit like an epithelium. An epithelium is a cell wall construction, like the many layers that, that, that go outside, your, outside and inside your skin, that work together in complementary ways, that pass materials through in gentle, diffusing ways. You can see the individual protocell environments that I was speaking about earlier, capturing carbon, translating them into harmless precipitant, and some of these very gentle movements. Now these are fueled by muscle wire, shape memory alloy, which has a, diff a mechanism which works rather differently from gears and motors, the kind of strong mechanisms from the Industrial Revolution. Shape memory, memory alloys work by contracting and by working with just very small amounts of trickles of current, much like the proteins in your own muscles work. And alongside those mechanisms, we work with a very gentle, flexible structural framework that works like textiles. Here you can see the individual elements, the chevrons clipping together in tetrahedral forms, which is a fundamental kind of efficient space packing system from, from nature. And this makes a corrugated diagrid, which is the basic kind of fabric it can span, it can take flexibility, it can shift and move and take on quite complex forms as the basic kind of building block of, 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 of the entire system. This very flexible, lightweight structural scaffold that makes the building skins and takes on the, the, di the different movements that move throughout the whole system. Here then you can see then that this kind of fabric is able to take on very small, flexible, rolling kinds of movement that work in lovely kind of sensitive mutual relationships with yourself. In the case of the project that I share with my colleagues, the way we're enacting this is by building this in direct practical material terms through the hyperbolic scaffolds, through the ability to flex and multiply, to have radical efficiency in these works. There's about eight cubic feet for about 80,000 in uh, cubic feet of, cl of enclosed volume. Um, so these things are expanded and are radically efficient in environmental terms. Also, in the design sense, not of making something strong and bounded and absolutely durable, but of deliberately making things resonant and weak and flexible and trying to make things as radically sensitive and responsive as possible, setting up exchanges as being design value, sensitivity as being a design value, rather than strength and command. So there's a set of beliefs that are embedded in this kind of very practical design work. Let me sum up then. I've spoken about a historical sense of architecture, the idea that perhaps bounded, closed, efficient, territory enclosing things define a previous idea of what buildings can be. And I've tried to talk about some practical strategies for achieving a kind of entangled, mutual, sensitive world of architecture. I hope these kind of examples might be a contribution to some possible futures in architecture. Thank you. <laughs>